And ultimately, that is the source of the power that enables us to go forth and to do the things that God has set before us. And it provides the real key to our being able to deal with, to overcome, to triumph over any problem that we face or that we encounter. Being able to utilize the power of God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. That power that comes out from God that is the means and the basis of transforming our lives. Transforming and renewing our minds. Being transformed and renewed from the inside out. Having imparted to us the very divine nature, the very nature of God, the earnest of our inheritance. As we approach the day of Pentecost, it is very appropriate and very fitting that we should focus in on the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Apostle Paul dealt with that in 2 Timothy chapter 1. We'll pick it up in verse 5. He said, speaking to Timothy... When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, the unpretended faith, the real sincere faith that you have, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, I'm persuaded in you also. Therefore, I put you in remembrance. I remind you that you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hand. The gift of God which you have through the laying on of my hands, I remind you to stir up that gift. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, the spirit of cowardice and timidity. He has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. As we focus in on that, And on the working and the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, let's pay special attention to what the Apostle Paul enjoined here. He told Timothy, he said, I'm reminding you to stir up the gift of God which is within you. The gift of God that you have through the laying on of my hands. Because we receive God's Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands following baptism. What did he mean to stir up the gift of God? Well, what is that a reference to? The analogy that Paul is using here, drawing... It's a very familiar one. Anybody that's had a fireplace or a wood heater, wood stove. Uh, wood was, of course, the primary means of heating and cooking back at the time that Paul wrote this. And, of course, that was a primary means of uh, heating, certainly, for uh, quite a number uh, as uh, uh, back years ago. And uh, not that many years ago, a lot of us uh, grew up with the use of wood heaters and wood stoves and uh, fireplaces. <clears throat> And one thing about a wood fire, you know, it begins to burn down. And when it begins to burn down low uh, and the flames disappear and an ash layer forms over the top of of what's there, over the top of the coals, and the amount of heat that is being put out is very little. And there's no open flame. If if this was a campfire or something and you had a a little grill set up on top and a a coffee pot up there, uh, the coffee begins to... uh, uh, cool off and it loses its heat you know at an earlier time it was maybe uh, uh, almost up to boiling and uh, now uh, or was boiling and, and now though the fire has died down low and, and the flames are out and there's a, just a white uh, ash layer there on top and there's no open flame and whatever's on the uh, on the grill there is cooled off what do you do? Well, you come in and you stir up the fire. When you begin to stir it up, the ash layer is knocked off. Uh, Live coals are exposed to the air. And as the air hits them, uh, these live coals, as they're stirred up, flame once again ignites and as fuel is added to the fire, uh, you can have a roaring blaze in just a very short time. And that same coffee pot that was sitting up there where the coffee has grown pretty uh, pretty lukewarm, now it begins to heat up because as the flame blazes up and the fire gets hot, whatever's sitting on top, that begins to heat up. 
And that fire is stirred up. It's rekindled. The word that the Apostle Paul used in 2 Timothy 1, 7, or 1, 6, when he said stir up the gift, that, that word for stir up, it's only used once in the New Testament, and it is a word that does mean to rekindle, to bring back to life again, as in the case of a fire. That's, that's the significance of it. That's what it means. The analogy itself is brought out even back in Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation 2 and 3, the history of the church of God is laid out in advance. The book of Revelation is a prophecy. Jesus said that the purpose of, of uh, this was to reveal to his servants those things which must shortly come to pass. So to read Revelation 2 and 3, uh, messages to the seven churches, and say it was purely a matter of historical interest involving seven churches in Asia Minor almost 2,000 years ago, uh, is ridiculous. The whole book was written to show the servants of God the things that must come to pass. The things of the future, beginning from that point and coming forward to our day and the times immediately ahead of us. And the seven churches of Asia Minor typify the entire church of God down through its history. Seven is God's number of completion and perfection. And he picked out those seven churches on a Roman mail route in Asia Minor to typify the church of God throughout its history, the seven stages or eras through which the church would pass between its inception at the time of Pentecost in 31 A.D., and the time of the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. The final seventh stage, the final seventh era, is the church at Laodicea, typified by the church at Laodicea. Prophetically, we see that the church at Philadelphia and the church at Laodicea will both be extant at the end time, the church at Laodicea being the final one to emerge on the scene. And the message to the church at Laodicea, this final seventh stage, and, and you know, brethren, we need to take special heed and special pay special serious attention to these warnings and these admonitions because as we look around in the world today and as we see the fulfillment of Bible prophecy on the world scene, we see the events in Europe and the things that have happened uh, on the world scene. If those events are taking place and as we see the emergence and the beginning to rise of the final seventh revival of the whole Holy Roman Empire, as we see the final emergence of these things on the world scene, what we need to understand is that the prophecies relating to the church are just as sure and just as real as any prophecies relating to the world around us. And these prophecies relating to the church are things to which we need to take very special heed because they are warnings and admonitions to us. The warning here to the church at Laodicea. He says in verse 15, I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot, so then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth. The church at Laodicea was indicted for being lukewarm. For being lukewarm. Paul told Timothy, and it's preserved for us, that we have to stir up the gift of God which is within us. What happens when the flames die down and there are only some ash-covered embers that remain? Whatever's on top, whatever's in the pot, quits boiling and grows tepid. It grows lukewarm. The only way to move from being lukewarm to hot is to stir up the embers, to rekindle the flame. That's the only way to move from lukewarm to hot. I'll tell you what, years ago, and I can remember in college 25 years ago, sitting around and discussing with various ones. And we used to wonder and speculate how in the world the Laodicean church could ever emerge. And we said, well, you know, when these things began to happen, when these events, when these prophetic events began to transpire in Europe and the Middle East, when these things appear on the world scene, when we can actually see these things happening, why, it would seemingly so electrify and stir up everyone. How in the world could people be lukewarm at a time like that? Why, it seems like that would, that would be the time when everybody would be the most stirred up and excited. How can a Laodicean church ever come? We used to wonder about that and speculate on that and sort of uh, try to come up with scenarios and, and, and wonder how some of these things could emerge. 
Well, I'll tell you what, I don't have nearly as many questions about how it could happen now as I had then. You know, what about you? Are you more stirred up and excited and on fire for the truth than you've ever been? As all these things have unfolded in the world around, are you more stirred up? Are you more on fire for the truth of God than you've ever been? Or have we grown? Have you grown? Have we grown? A little more lukewarm, a little more tepid. The indictment here of Laodicea was that they were lukewarm. This is one of the indictments. There are others. But you see, the antidote to that is stirring up the gift of God, which is within you. Stirring up the embers. Rekindling the flame. You know how that's done? Paul gives the key, or John gives the key a little earlier in Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, writing to the church at Ephesus. The church that characterized the first stage, first era in the history of God's church. And he said in verse 4 of Revelation 2, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. You don't have that first love. You don't have that first zeal, that first intensity. You've left your first love. What do you do when you know the first love isn't there the way it ought to be, the way it once was? What do you do? Revelation 2, 5. Remember from whence you're fallen. Repent. And do the first works. Or else I'll come unto you quickly and will remove your candlestick out of its place, except you repent. Remember from whence you're fallen, repent, and do the first works. That, you see, is the key. That plays a very important part in how we stir up the gift of God that is within us. How we recapture that first love. We have to... First, to remember, to think back, to remember from whence we're fallen. Bring to mind what we were doing and the way that we responded. Think about the changes that we made in our lives. Remember from whence you're fallen. Repent. Repent. Because ultimately, sin is the key. Repent. And do the first works. He didn't say wait until you feel like it. Do the first works. If we're doing the first works, the first feelings will follow. Not precede, but follow. Remember from whence you're fallen, repent, and do the first works. That's the key. Getting back to that first love. Moving from lukewarm to stirred up, fiery, burning hot involves stirring up the gift of God which is within us. Back in the book of Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 15, we have the story of the revival that took place during the reign of King Asa. Now, King Asa came to the throne of Judah about uh, 25 years or 20, uh, 22, 25 years after the death of King Solomon. He was the great-grandson of Solomon, came to power, came to the throne uh, in a little under 25 years after Solomon's death. The nation, of course, of Judah had gotten away from God. Israel got away from God and never returned. Judah had periods of revival. And they had a period of revival under King Asa, under King Jehoshaphat, later on under King Hezekiah and King Josiah. This was the first period of revival that Judah experienced under King Asa. And we find that it began in the 15th year of Asa's reign, which was about just under 40 years after Solomon's death. And of course, the nation had gotten off track during the final years of Solomon's reign, and things had continued along. And we find, as we pick it up in Second Chronicles 15, because this particular revival, interestingly enough, is set at the time of Pentecost, uh, involved a revival that centered around the celebration of Pentecost. Uh, we find reference to that in verse 10 of Second Chronicles 15, when it speaks of them gathering in Jerusalem in the third month. Pentecost always comes in the first week of the third month of God's calendar. 
We find that in verse 3 of Second Chronicles 15, that for a long season Israel had been without the true God, without a teaching priest and without the law. They had gotten off track. And when they did in their trouble turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And in those days there was no peace to him that went out nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And the and nation was destroyed of nation, or the Hebrew literally is nation, was beaten in pieces of nation. City of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. It was a time of strife and trouble, a time of all sorts of internal and external turmoil. In fact, it was a time very similar to our day today. We live in a time of war and world war and fear of war. This 20th century has been a time of either world war or fear of war throughout nearly the entirety of the 20th century. If we have not been in a war, we have been in the fear of war. We've been in hot wars and cold wars. And right now, we're in times where there are all sorts of adversities and struggles going on around the world. Jesus Christ talked about in Matthew 24 that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The very focal point of Bible prophecy there in Matthew 24. Kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation. Kingdom are referring to the, the nation states of today. Problems and, and, and difficulties and warfare on the international scale. Nation against nation, the word nation is ethnos in the Greek, refers to various ethnic uh, strife and rivalry. And we see that around the world. We see it in our own nation, and we see it in, in nations of Europe and Africa and Asia. We see it throughout the Middle East. We see it all over the world. Nation against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. A time of strife. A time of adversity and difficulty. We live in the times that are described in the pages of your Bible. Here, they were going through a forerunner of some of those times. Nation was destroyed of nation, city of city, and God did vex them with all adversity. And they sought God. And the admonition was given to them, Be you strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and he put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin. And he gathered everyone together in Jerusalem in the third month to celebrate Pentecost. It was a time of rededication. And they offered unto the Eternal at the same time the spoil which they had brought, 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Eternal God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. It was a renewal of the covenant that they had made, that the nation had entered into with God on the first day of Pentecost at Mount Sinai under Moses. They renewed that covenant. You know the starting point? Get rid of the idols. Over and over, when you go through the Scriptures and you read of times of revival in God's Word, you read that the first step was to get rid of the idols. Now, we don't usually think about that as it applies to us. We think, well, you know, we don't have idols. Well, I'll grant you in, some time, in, in, in the most direct uh, application of that. I think I've been, into the, uh, been in the homes of... Everybody's sitting here in this room and, and uh, just, uh, virtually, uh, I can't recall anybody has a great big, uh, you know, one of these big fat leering Buddhas sitting up there in the corner and they bow down to it and do obeisance three times a day. Uh, I, I haven't noticed any of that. Uh, you know, maybe you uh, put it away in the back room when, when I came, heard me knocking at the door and moved it out of the room. I, I, I don't think so. Well, you know, we read that and we think, well, you know, idols, yeah, yeah, boy, those idols are bad. I'm sure glad I don't do any of that. What is an idol? 
It's something physical. It's a material, physical thing that stands in the way of worshiping the true God. It's something that, that really involves our giving our worship, our loyalty, our allegiance to the created rather than the Creator. You know, Paul defines idolatry in the New Testament. He said, covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness violates the commandment against idolatry because it involves uh, exalting the created. We live in a world that is absolutely preoccupied with material things. A world that's preoccupied with materialism. That's the idolatry of the modern age. Man is so impressed by the things which he can see and taste and touch and feel and measure. All of the physical things around us, the things that can be discerned through the physical senses. And we're impressed and wrapped up in those things. First step. First step toward revival spiritually is getting rid of the idols. What are your idols? What are the things that have gotten in your way and interfered with your relationship with God that have interrupted your relationship with God? First step here is getting rid of the idols. Removing them. A rededication to sacrifice and to service. Rededication to sacrifice and service. This is what's involved in stirring up and rekindling the gift of God which is within us. Stirring up, rekindling God's gift. Stir up the gift of God which is within you by the laying on of my hands, Paul said. It's very vital that we do that. That we shake the ash layer off the coals. Stir them up. That they be reignited. That fuel is added to the fire. And what's there goes from being lukewarm and tepid to being boiling hot. Being zealous. Being zealous. So the first thing we're told, Paul tells us about God's Holy Spirit, is we need to stir it up. We need to stir up and rekindle that gift of God which is within us. And then he goes on to tell us, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. So one of the things is we stir up and rekindle this gift that is within us, the spirit of God. One thing that we know about the spirit of God as we begin to look at the spirit of God and what it does in our lives is that it is not the spirit of fear. This word, there are several words that are used for fear in the New Testament, several Greek words. Uh, this particular word uh, is uh, the word uh, dahlia, D-E-I-L-I-A. It's only used uh, a little over a half a dozen times in the New Testament, uh, or less than a dozen times anyway. It basically means to being overly timid and cowardly. Timidity and cowardice is what it's talking about, or the sense of the word Let's notice why God talks about this spirit of fear as being something that his people should not have. The fact that the, the, what God gives us is not the spirit of fear. And yet, on the other hand, we read that there is a right fear, there is a godly fear. But you know, there are two different words that are used. They're both translated fear in our uh, English versions, but there's a different word that's used that means something different. We're going to see that in a few moments. If we go back to Mark chapter 4 and verse 37, Mark 4, 37, it says, There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. And he, Christ, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him. And they said unto him, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And then they feared exceedingly 
Then they really got scared. And they said to one another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Notice here in verse 40, he says, Why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? This kind of fear is the enemy of faith. This fear, this timidity, this cowardice, this fright, was based on what they could see. Faith is based on what God says. This sort of fear is based on what you can see. And what they could see was the rain was pouring, the wind was blowing, the waves were crashing, the ship was being tossed and was taking on water. And to all intents and purposes, and you remember, these weren't people who had never been offshore before. These were men, several of whom, who had made their lives on the water as commercial fishermen. So this wasn't just a little average run-of-the-mill squall. This was something that terrorized even men who had spent their lives on the water in boats. Men who were men of the sea. This was quite a storm. And it terrified them. And Jesus said, why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? They lacked faith. That's why the reason they lacked faith was because they were filled with this sort of fear. A fear that was brought on by what they could see around. Now let's go on to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 27. Here Jesus Christ is talking to the disciples on the night of the Passover just prior to his arrest and crucifixion. And he said in verse 27 of John 14, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now here Christ contrasts peace with fear. <coughs> the word for afraid here is the same word, fear. Christ said, look, I'm leaving. Something is going to happen to me, and you're not going to fully understand, but I'm preparing you, and I'm going to leave a peace with you. My peace. Don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Don't be filled with timidity and cowardice. I am setting before you a job to do. Don't be overwhelmed. There is a peace that you can have. So the fear that Christ was talking about is a fear that blocks out faith, that blocks out peace. There's an absence of faith and an absence of peace in the presence of this sort of fear. God is not the author, is not the source of this sort of fear. In Revelation chapter 21, where we read of the time of the new heavens and the new earth, Revelation 21, 7, we're told, He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and again, the same word for fear, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, what's so bad about this sort of fear? Let's go back to Matthew 25. Why would the fearful be excluded? Let's go back to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 25. You remember the story here is the story of the parable that Christ gave in Matthew 25 about the giving of the talents. And the Lord called his servants and he gave one five and another two and another one. And the one that had five talents went out and gained five more. The one that had two talents went and gained two more. They reported back when the Lord came and, and he told them, Well done, good and faithful servant. In verse 24, the one that had received the one is addressed. And in verse 25, he said, I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the earth. I was afraid. I was paralyzed with fear. And I didn't act. I didn't do what you commissioned me to do. I was so afraid I would do it wrong that I did nothing at all. 
You see, fear, this kind of fear, when it's in control, can only produce either paralysis or panic. Either paralysis or panic. It is a destructive fear. It is a fear that blocks out faith. It is a fear that blocks out peace. When this sort of fear permeates, this sort of terror or of cowardice, of timidity, uh, this, this timid, cowardly spirit that blocks out faith and peace and prevents actions. It prevents action. Now, there's a contrast. You know, it talks about fear in a positive way in, in uh, uh, Hebrews 5, for instance, uh, in um, verse 7, speaking of Christ, who in the days of his flesh... When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect, being made complete and finished, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. We're told that he was heard in that he feared. This word for fear is a totally different word in the Greek language. Eulabia is the word in the Greek. No, no relationship at all to dahlia. Totally different word. It has to do with a godly fear, with a reverence. This is a fear that produces action, where the other is a cowardice and a timidity that produces inaction, that blocks faith and peace. Let's notice just a couple other places in Hebrews where this other term is used. We see that Christ uh, had a right kind of fear. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Now, Noah had the right kind of fear. It was a fear that was compatible with faith because Noah believed what God said. He acted on it. Noah believed what God said. By faith, he was warned of things that he couldn't see, but he believed it and he moved with fear. That means he moved quickly. He moved in a, in a wary and circumspect way. He, he was moved with a, with a motivation. To hurry up and get this thing done. He got on the ball. Noah believed God and he acted on that belief. It was faith in action. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28, it says, Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The same turn. So it's a godly fear, a fear that involves a reverence, a, an attitude that makes us careful and circumspect out of reverence and awe for God. It is not a cowardice and a timidity, even though the words are often rendered the same way in the English language, two totally different terms, two totally different phrases, two totally different things. Uh, in the original. So God has not given us the spirit of fear in that he has not given us the spirit of timidity and cowardice cringing in a corner somewhere absolutely panicked or paralyzed. No, we need to stir up the gift of God to rekindle what God has placed within us because God has not given us the spirit of fear. But He has given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, what does that involve? The spirit of power. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer, model prayer, an outline of prayer. And in Matthew chapter 6, that's given in verse 13 of Matthew 6. It says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This word for power, dunamis, 
in the Greek. Same word we get our word dynamic from. It is therefore a dynamic power. Speaking of God, we're told that he possesses the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So right along with the kingdom and the glory is the power, that dynamic power possessed, intrinsic to God himself. On down in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 22, he says, Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out demons, and in your name done many wonderful works. The word translated wonderful works here is the same word that's rendered power. A dynamic power, a wonderful power, a miraculous power. That's what it's talking about. That's made even a little more plain back in Matthew 13. Matthew 13 and verse 54. When he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogues, insomuch that they were astonished, and they said, Whence has this man this wisdom and these mighty works? The word mighty works here is translated from this term dunamis. Whence has this man, this, these mighty works, this dynamic power, this miraculous power? On over in the book of Mark, In chapter 6, Mark 6 and verse 2, we're told that when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished. And they says, Whence has this man these things? What wisdom is this that is given unto him? And even such mighty works, such dunamis, such dynamic power, are wrought by his hands. Isn't this the carpenter, son of Mary? On down in verse 5, we're told of Jesus, he could there do no mighty work. No dunamis. No dynamic, powerful action. Except that he did lay his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. This kind of faithless attitude blocks the power of God. It blocks the flow of God's miraculous power. What kind of power is available? Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. He told the disciples, you wait in Jerusalem until you're imbued with power from on high. What power is this? The very power of the one who spoke the words, let there be light, and there was light. The power of the one who brought the universe into being by the word of his power. The power that made the sun and the moon stand still in the sky. The power that parted the Red Sea in the days of Moses. The power that raised the dead. The power of God. That power is available to us. God's Spirit is first and foremost the Spirit of power, the Spirit of miraculous, dynamic power, the same power that flowed through Jesus Christ. And that power is available to us. Our God is a miracle-working God. By unbelief, we constrict the flow of that spirit of power. We constrict the flow of that spirit of power through unbelief. Continuing on in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 and verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit, in the power, the dunamis of the Spirit, into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. He returned in the power of the Spirit. Back in the end of the book of Luke, 
in chapter 24 and in verse 49. He said in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. And in verse 49, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So the very power of the spirit in which Jesus Christ himself went forth, this very power of the spirit was promised to the people of God. In Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, the disciples ask in verse 6, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And in verse 7, Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power, dunamis, miraculous power, dynamic power. You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. You shall receive power. The power of God's Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy, chapter 3, in verse 1, we're told, This know also in the last days, perilous times, dangerous times shall come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, goes through the list. And in verse 5, it says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Having a form, having the outward manifestation, the form of idolatry, he said the form of godliness. So he's talking about something that outwardly conforms to what God says. He's talking about an outward conformity. But there is a lack of power, a denial of that miracle-working, transforming power of the Spirit of God. God has given us not the spirit of fear, not the spirit of timidity and cowardice, not the kind of spirit that produces inaction, that produces panic or paralysis. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but He's given us the spirit of power, the power of God. The very power source of the universe. The one who commanded and brought the universe into being by the word of his power. That power is available through the Spirit of God to you and to me. He's given the spirit of power and of love. And of love. Love is the basis by which this power is utilized. Matthew chapter 24. Again, going back to the focal point of Bible prophecy. Warnings and admonitions to God's people. We need to read these warnings and understand that there's a reason why God admonishes His people about these matters. We need to take heed. Because if we don't take heed to these prophecies, we will wind up fulfilling them. He warned in verse 9 of His people, His disciples, being delivered up to be afflicted. And in verse 10, he talked about some of his disciples, some of his followers, his people being offended and betraying one another and hating one another. Spirit of internal dissension and discord and animosity and resentment and hostility, a judgmental attitude, a critical condemning attitude. 
attitude that engenders hatred. We live in a world that is increasingly fractured. And that fracturing, whose author is Satan the devil, can come right on down and affect all of us if we allow that attitude to affect us. Christ warned it about it right here. He said, many will be offended, betray one another, hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity, because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Verse 12, he said, because iniquity, because lawlessness. Then this word iniquity means uh, a lack of law, a disregard, a casual, careless attitude toward the law of God. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, there are three words for love in the Greek language uh, that are most commonly used for love. One is the word philia, which means friendship, is frequently used in the New Testament. Uh, the other, Another is the word agape, which means a godly love, and this is the word that's used here, the word that's used in 2 Timothy 1.7. It is most commonly used or frequently used in the New Testament. Third word, eros, uh, the word erotic is derived from, refers to a sexual love. It's not... A, a term that it's a term in the Greek language, but but it's not one that is uh, used in in the New Testament itself. But here, Christ is talking about this agape love, this godly love, and he says because iniquity, because this lawless attitude, this spirit of a casual, careless disregard for the law of God. Because that's going to abound. That's going to, that's going to grow. That's going to be multiplied. That's going to become very prevalent. A careless, casual attitude toward the commandments and the law of God. A lack of emphasis in taking seriously God's law. And you see, when that is de-emphasized, A self-centered selfishness takes the place. And because iniquity, because this lawless attitude, this spirit of lawlessness shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. That is the byproduct. That is the consequence. That love grows cold when a lack of regard for the law of God becomes more prevalent. Over in John chapter 15, John chapter 15, Jesus again speaking here the night of his crucifixion or the night of his final Passover just prior to his crucifixion and the following, during the daylight portion following. In John 15, in verse 9, he says, The Father, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You know, one thing to understand in terms of God's love, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. God's love is an unconditional love, but a relationship with God is very much conditional. You know, God loved us. He commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, but while we were yet sinners, we had no relationship with God. We were not in fellowship with God. God loved us, but it was love from a distance. If we're going to have a relationship with God, we have to respond to that love. God extends that love toward us, but if we're going to have a relationship with Him, we have to, if we're, in other words, to abide in that love. If we're going to dwell in that love, if we're going to share a relationship with God, 
then we have to respond to that love. There's a condition attached to the relationship, and the condition is that we keep His commandments. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. These words have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. This is the kind of love, godly love, that God calls upon us as his people to have. A sacrificial love. A love that's willing to be inconvenienced. Godly love. The kind of love that God Himself has. The kind of love that is shed abroad in our, in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're told in Romans 5, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that love must flow out. Fear and resentment constrict the flow of that love and stop it from flowing. Resentments about the past, fears about the future. When those attitudes are present, they block forgiveness. You can't have, you know, when, when resentments about the past and fears about the future are there, they block forgiveness. And when forgiveness is blocked, the flow of God's love is constricted. God's love is shed abroad in our hearts through the power of His Spirit. God's Spirit is the Spirit of power and of love, godly love. In the book of Ephesians, we read of that. Ephesians chapter 3. In verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Be filled with the fullness of God. Having God's nature permeating us. And God is love. That needs to be an attitude that reflects itself in our lives and in our dealings with one another. You, you can't have that when we're off divided into little groups and little cliques. And, and uh, uh, we, we, you know, well, I, I just, you know, have my, my little friends and my little group and, and, you know, just us, two or three or half a dozen or however many it is. And, and we're... we're you know, we like each other, but we don't have anything to do with anybody else. That's natural, and there's nothing wrong with the fact that you're going to have some friends that are closer than others. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Jesus Christ himself uh, refers to John as the disciple whom he loved. He had a special, close bond of friendship with John that was unique in terms of his relationship even with the others. We read of David and Jonathan. That... That close bond. There's nothing wrong with that, but when it is an exclusive, cliquish type of relationship, that is wrong. The only ones I'm going to have love for are people just like me. You know, my little group. Uh, my age, my sex, my race, my group. Just over here. Just us. That sort of an exclusive, exclusivist, cliquish mentality is not what God talks about. Yes, having certain close friends, having people you really hit it off with and having a special bond with, there's nothing wrong with that. But it should not be to the exclusion of having a relationship of love with others. Having God's love that flows out from us. Willingness to help and to give and to serve, to love and to care about others. That's why he says in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Be you therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us for an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling savor. Many places that we could go. We're, let's notice just one more place here in 1 John chapter 4. 
First John chapter 4, reading of the very nature of God and our relationship. We're told in First John 4 and verse 16 that God is love. We have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in Him. Herein is our love made perfect, made complete, made full and mature, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Perfect love, mature, complete, finished love, casts out fear, because fear has torment. This is fear in the sense of terror. That has torment. He that loves, he that fears, he that's terrorized, is not made complete and whole in love. We love him because he first loved us. When we grasp the love of God, there's nothing to be terrorized of because if God be for us, who can be against us? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I'll be terrorized by no evil. Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The source of our comfort, the source of our peace, the source of our confidence is God. Walking hand in hand with our Father in heaven and our elder brother, Jesus Christ, who love us. God has given us the spirit of power, of dynamic, miracle-working power, the spirit of love. Godly love and the spirit of sound-mindedness. The spirit of a sound mind. Now, what is that? Well, very good illustration. is found in Mark chapter 5. You remember the story of the man that had possessed of the legion of demons? He was a stark, raving maniac, uh, living among the tombs, uh, running around without any clothes on, terrorized everybody. Nobody wanted to even get close out there. Christ cast the demons out. And they entered into a herd of swine. You remember the story there in Mark chapter 5. And in verse 15 of Mark 5, the people in the town came to Jesus, and they saw him that was possessed with the devil and that had the legion... The many demons, they saw him sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and that really scared them. You know, they were afraid. That that really, uh, boy, they couldn't believe that. That that really scared them. They saw this man sitting there with his clothes on, in his right mind. Now, this word "right mind" means sound mind. He was self-controlled. He was self-possessed. He was sound-minded. For evidently, perhaps the first time in his life. Or certainly the first time in many, many years of his life. Of a sound mind. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of sound-mindedness. Let's notice a few other places the word is, is used because we're going to see it has a little broader use here. Uh, this is what we find there, the use in Mark chapter 5 is the use we normally think of. That's what we usually think of with sound-mindedness. But sound mind uh, means more than just sanity in, in the clinical sense of the word. Uh, Romans chapter 12, in, beginning in verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. The word soberly here is the word that is translated sound-minded in 2 Timothy 1.7. To think, not to think more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has, get, has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So it's saying we're to have an accurate, sound, balanced, sane appraisal of ourselves. Not to think more highly than we ought to think, not to have some inflated, vanity-filled, uh, egotistic idea of ourselves, 
and our worth and our value, nor, on the other hand, to have some uh, way down wallowing in the mire of self-pity and, and, and a sense of inferiority. Not to have, but to have an accurate, balanced appraisal, to realize we're a human being made in the image of God. We have strengths and weaknesses. We have talents. We have strengths. We also have corresponding weaknesses and frailties and limitations. And that we have access to the power of God that of ourselves we're very limited. Not to think more highly than we ought to think, but to think soberly. To think in a rational, sound, balanced way. A balanced, healthy appraisal of ourselves. This word is used quite frequently uh, in the book of Titus. Reflecting the way that various ones ought to be. Now, at least the root of this, it, it's uh, there are two or three uh, um, slightly different forms of the word, but basically they mean the same thing. They're all derived from this. And the word sound-minded, literally in the Greek, it means of a wise mind, uh, because the first part of it is Sophie, or so, it comes from Sophie or Sophia, which means uh, wisdom. Uh, so it means wise of mind, a wise mind. In Titus 1, in verse 8, speaking here, Titus given instructions about ordaining elders, and we're, he's told that these men should be lovers of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober. Which means more than simply the fact of not laying around drunk all day. That's, that's not uh, the, the limitation of the word sober. It certainly includes that, but it's talking about a person who's self-controlled, self-restrained, a person not given to, to uh, exaggerated excess, but a person who is in control, of, who exemplifies sound-minded or wise-minded, sober, just, holy, temperate. Coming on down in Titus 2, as he goes through and he talks about the, old, old, the older men in Titus 2, 2, the first characteristic he mentions is sober. The same word, sober. Wise-minded, sound-minded, self-controlled, alert, self-controlled. Coming on down in verse 4, uh, he says that the younger women are to be taught to be sober. To be taught to be sober, to be wise-minded, to have a, a wise, balanced approach. In verse 5, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Now, the word discreet uh, uses this same term here. It, it's a slightly different form of the word. It has more the connotation of decent, modest, using good judgment. All of this is included in being sound-minded. On down, uh, uh, young men in verse 6 are ex exhorted to be sober-minded, to be self-restrained, to use good judgment in what they do. In verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Soberly, sound-mindedly. In a way that exemplifies a soundness of mind, a wise-minded approach. You know, the world is pictured as spiritually being intoxicated under the influences of the great false church. Revelation chapter 17 talks about how the whole, all nations have been made drunk on the wine of the great whore of Revelation 17. The false doctrine have produced... In effect, that God labels as spiritual drunkenness, exaggerated, out of control conduct that characterizes the world in which we live. Exaggerated, out of control, crazy conduct should not characterize us. God has given us the spirit of a sound mind, the spirit of, of sanity, of a balanced approach. Now, let's understand just a little bit more about this, as we notice here in 1 Timothy 
Uh, well, let's, let's go back to Deuteronomy. Where, where do we get this? Spirit of a sound mind. The spirit of a wise mind. Wise, wise-headed, wise-minded. Where, where does this come from? That's what we're told God has given us the spirit of. Let's notice in Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4, verse 1, it says, Now hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and the judgments which I have given you, to do them, that you may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers give you. Don't add to the words that I command you. Don't diminish. Keep the commandments. Coming on down in verse 6 of Deuteronomy 4. Keep, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. This is your wisdom and your understanding. What's the source of our wisdom and understanding? The law of God, the commandments of God. What makes us wise-headed, wise-minded, sound-minded, following in the law of God? You know, most people, why do people do what they do? Most people follow either their feelings, they respond to the way they feel, their emotions, they follow their feelings, or they follow what other people around them think they ought to do. Well, you know, I wouldn't do this, or I'd put up, I wouldn't put up with that, or I think you ought to do so-and-so. They either respond to the pressure of what people around them think, or they respond to the impulses of their own feelings and emotions, or the combination of those two. Neither of those are a basis to follow and to base your life upon, because there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. If you follow your feelings or you follow other people's thoughts and feelings and ideas, you're headed for trouble. The only thing that you can rely on to follow is to follow what God says. Even if other people don't like it and even if you don't feel like doing it, the safe path is the path that God says. The path of righteousness. You see, it says here, Keep the commandments. This is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. You know, back in Psalm 119, verses 99 and 100, it talks about, David says, I have more wisdom than all the ancients, than all my teachers. Have greater wisdom. Why? Because I keep your commandments. I keep your commandments. You know, the... The real key. God leads us in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. God will lead us in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. What is righteousness? All thy commandments are righteousness. Told Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 172. All God's commandments are righteousness. They delineate. God's Word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path that illuminates the way we ought to go. And if we'll follow that way, if we'll follow what God says, if we'll follow His commandments, if we'll follow where He leads, it will lead us in the paths of righteousness. It will lead us in the way of a sound-minded, balanced, healthy, wise-minded approach. It may not be the way we feel like, and it may not be the way that others agree with, But if we're following in the paths of righteousness, we're following in the paths that produce a sound-minded, wise-minded approach. God has not given us the spirit of fear, not given us the spirit of timidity and cowardice, not given us the spirit that paralyzes and panics, a spirit that blocks out faith and peace. But He's given us the spirit of power, of dynamic, miracle-working power of God. He has given us the spirit of power, the spirit of love, godly love, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, flowing out. And He's given us the spirit of a sound mind, of a wise-minded, sound approach that is delineated by the law of God and His commandments. As we celebrate... Within a week, the Feast of Pentecost. As we're reminded of the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, we need to focus in on our need to stir up that gift of God which is within us. To stir up, to reignite, to rekindle the flames of God's Spirit. To produce a spiritual zeal and drive. To stir up that gift of God which is within us.
recognizing that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind.